Dear ladies and gentlemen, friends from all the world and Vienna, we are very happy to be here tonight on this wonderful hot summer evening. And I'm also very, very glad that um, we managed to get these two experts on the panel today. It was for me a long time wish to bring them together and also the topic actually. Uh, we called the talk, Guilty Perpetrators, Responsible Victims. Can whole nations be judged when their leaders go to war? Um, I have to say that I, as an Austrian-German person, always grappled with this question, um, how much we ask uh, my grandparents uh, what they did during the war and why they didn't resist uh, as much as one would wish a totalitarian, evil, awful regime. And this is a question that the Russians will probably have to ask themselves after this war, why there are no mass demonstrations in the streets. And there are reasons for all of this which we would like to discuss tonight here. My two experts that uh, we invited are Desi Gavrilova, who many of you know, because she's one of the driving forces behind the intellectual uh, debate scene in Vienna. She comes from Bulgaria originally, where she founded the Red House Center for Culture and Debate, which was crucial, I think, in Sofia at the time also, um, <clears throat> to start this kind of civil society um, discourse uh, in a democratic Bulgaria. And she came to Vienna, fortunately for us, and founded the European Network of Houses for Debate Time to talk. And these, her uh, organization uh, channels a lot of her, um, uh, of the talks that are being done uh, at the Vienna Humanities Festival, which in itself is a cooperation of Vienna Museum and IVM, on the Institute for the Wissenschaften for Menschen, uh, that was founded in 2016. Desi was very crucial in it, and she also does, of course, other things. <coughs> Um, as a curator and cultural consultant and a drama author. Uh, my other guest tonight is Marcy Shore, who uh, uh, fortunately uh, not only teaches at Yale University, she's an associate professor at the Department of History there. She teaches modern European intellectual history and uh, maybe that's also one of the reasons why she comes uh, to Vienna uh, on a few months per year, where she is a regular visiting fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences. She has written a book that we will mention tonight also, Caviar and Ashes, a Warsaw Generation's Life and Death in Marxism, <coughs> 1918 to 1968, and many other very interesting uh, books, but also essays and publications that deal with um, modern European intellectual history. Uh, her current book project is a history of phenomenology in East Central Europe, tentatively titled <laughs> Eyeglasses Floating in Space, Central European Encounters that came about while searching for truth. Um, I think searching for truth is one of the big issues that we see currently in uh, 2023 in every aspect of our lives in the West and in the East and in times of peace and war. And so this is a good subject for us to discuss. But what we want to talk about tonight, and I also hope for your input in this, because I think this is one of the uh, questions that are political, but also moral and ethical. And every person will have a different answer also to it, because it is, of course, very much up to very different aspects of a personality, but also of circumstance. If uh, you become an oppositional, if you are one of the silent majority, if you become a perpetrator or a victim, and uh, we have um, an American, uh, a Bulgarian, an Austrian here, so we already cover a lot of sort of national tragedy and, uh, and also responsibility of nations going to war and how we deal as individuals in these societies. So maybe to start, I, I would say that um, 
what uh, I think, Marcy, you came up with a quote from Václav Havel, who said that um, the line between victim and oppressor, oppressor runs de facto through each person, for everyone in his or her own way is both a victim and a supporter of the system. If you look, uh, Marcy, now at the situation in the Ukraine and in Russia, uh, I think we have uh, a lot of examples where uh, war uh, leading but also defending nations suddenly find themselves having this line running right through them, each, each individual. Can, we, can you elaborate on this? Um, yes. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you, Tessa. I'm always happy to talk with Desi. It's the first time it's occurred on a stage. <laughs> um, but <laughs> we've had many conversations over the years. The quote that Tessa just mentioned by Václav Havel, the line between victim and oppressor runs de facto through every person for each of us in his or her own way is both a victim and a supporter of the regime. That's from his very famous essay, The Power of the Powerless, um, which arguably was the single most important text of, of dissent to be produced in that post-1968 period, the second half of the communist period in Eastern Europe. And, and Havel, let me just kind of contextualize the quote if I could take a minute. He, it, it's called Motz bez Motznich in Czech, and I don't know what the German translation is. Tessa might know. No. Um, it's the power of the powerless in English. Yeah. You know, and he... Die Macht der Ohnmächtigen wahrscheinlich ungefähr so. Ne? Yeah, that's, that sounds right. I'm, I'm sure I've seen it in German, but I don't remember. The, the hero, the anti-hero of this essay is, is a green grocer, the Zelinarz, who is your ordinary guy this, the essay was written in 1978. Your ordinary guy in Czechoslovakia who every morning goes into his shop and next to the carrots and the onions puts the sign in the window saying workers of the world unite. And Havel says, why does he put the sign in the window? By 1978, nobody believes anymore. Nobody believes in the communist promise anymore. The greengrocer doesn't believe it. You know, the people buying the carrots and the onions don't believe it. Even the regime no longer believes it. And the regime knows that the people don't believe it, you know, and the people know that the regime knows. And everybody knows that everybody knows, but everybody keeps going on anyway. And Havel says, well, what else can the greengrocer do? I mean, he's obviously powerless. If he takes down the sign, you know, he, somebody could report on him. They could inform. He could be questioned. His children could lose their chance to study at university. His privileges of going on vacation could be revoked. If he continues to refuse, he could be detained, interrogated, imprisoned. And, um, and Havel said, well, but why would all those bad consequences befall the greengrocer for taking down a sign, the content of which nobody believes anyway? And Havel says, well, it seems that paradoxically, and maybe contrary to common sense, despite the fact that nobody believes that sign is very important to the regime. In fact, if one day all the greengrocers were to take down their signs, that would be the beginning of a revolution. Therefore, the greengrocer is not so powerless after all. Because he is powerful, he is also responsible and therefore guilty for it's, for it's the greengrocers who allow the game to go on in the first place. Um, and Havel says the greengrocer is living in bad faith, in Sartre's sense of mauvaise foi, of self-deception. He's not deceiving himself about his belief in communism. He knows he doesn't believe in communism. He's deceiving himself about his powerlessness. He's telling himself he couldn't possibly do anything else but to go along with the system, and that's what allows the system to go on. Um, and that became the kind of famous model of what Havel called post-totalitarianism, which we would probably call late communism, where the Stalinist fanaticism, the, the actual belief in the ideological promise, had disappeared, but people continue to kind of go along with the motions. You know? And what we're now kind of trying to understand you know, is we're looking for or grappling for, at some kind of new model to understand what's happened in, in Putin's Russia. 
you know, to understand is this a kind of post-post totalitarianism? Is it a neo-totalitarianism? What we do know that carries over both from Stalinism through that late communist period Havel describes to the present day is that to live in a totalitarian system is to be implicated in it. Because that neutral private space to live your life out of, out of the grasp of power or not contributing to power has been eliminated by the regime. You know, and so we're, we're looking at, and this is how the Ukrainians feel of course, that to, to be in this society is to contribute to it, is to allow it to go on in the first place. I ask, this is the last thing I'll say, I know I'm talking too long, academics always talk too long. Um, I, uh, Not you, true, by the way. <laughs> what you're saying. A, a Ukrainian colleague who, who works at the IMF was visiting New Haven, where I'm, I'm from. I, I normally live in the States. Um, a couple months ago this spring, you know, and I was saying to him, I was saying, Vlad, what would it like? What would it take? Like, you know, what would it take to turn things in Russia? And and he said, two million people in the streets of Moscow. Two million people in the streets of Moscow. It's over tomorrow. And I said, how do you know it's two million? Like, how do you know, like, it's 1.9 million not enough? I mean, what we saw at the beginning, of the, 500 people go out in protest, they arrest them all. 5,000 go out, they arrest them all. You know, 15,000 go out, they arrest them all. At some point, you know, at some point you reach a tipping point. At some, when is it that one additional person? Nobody knows, and therefore, in some sense, everybody is responsible for not being that one additional person. But that's the interesting question at the <clears throat> moment, that, of course, there are no mass pro protests in, in Moscow, and um, I personally would not blame uh, people not going to the streets in Moscow, because if you go, you might just end up for putting down flowers in front of Pushkin's memorial on Pushkin Square. Uh, you might end up for 15 years in prison for for uh, being a traitor to the state. So it's very harsh uh, to understand also the, the re reality that people live under. But Desi, um, if we pull this on to the, to the cultural sphere also, because we have a lively debate about Russian uh, artists and intellectuals and, and cultural managers from this vast <laughs> cultural space of the Russian state. Uh, how they react to this war when the war uh, started, uh, when Putin started the war in the Ukraine. And I would like to know how you, because you, you, some of your friends like uh, Marina Davidova, who were sort of very influential cultural um, um, curators and, and critics, some of them came out with very clear criticism and also left Russia, some didn't, and some are here and are not criticizing the war. Uh, where do, do we draw a line there in terms of our own moral position, or is it up to everyone how they, how they deal with it? Yeah. I think we are actually putting very high the bar of expectations to the people that leave Russia. And we are um, kind of expecting that everyone who is against the war would leave Russia immediately. But I think we have to give, um, somehow recognize that there are people who simply cannot. Uh, they have relatives, they have people uh, to care about. Um, there are people who don't speak foreign languages, for example. I mean, not everyone who is against the regime uh, can leave. And um, it doesn't mean that if you state you're necessarily a perpetrator and you are responsible uh, together uh, with the regime. And there are people, uh, I mean, we are asking all the time, okay, in Russia, they don't go on the streets. It's um, a dictatorship. Uh, they would have a very hard time. And actually here, probably I would mention uh, an article that I came uh, across, which is, I think, a rare, gives us a rare insight about what really in Russia think, because there was this uh, study done by, um, uh, it was published by Open Democracy Russia, and it was made by Anna Kulesnikova, uh, Kulisheva, sorry, who interviewed 100 Russians who are still in Russia, who oppose the war, uh, just to find out why are they not on the streets. This was the, the question. And she came up with eight reasons, just to cover this, like uh, what she found out. So she said, fear of arrest, beating, long prison sentences. Of course, we all know this is present there. Electronic tracking, this was surprising for me. It turns out that when you go 
there is a meeting somewhere uh, announced to protest and you know that your phone might be tracked and then you'll be stopped on the way and you'll be arrested while going there, etc. Or if not, you go there, you protest. After that, they look at the pictures, the videos, etc. They recognize you, they go, they question you, they detain you there, etc. Third reason. The feeling that no one will help. People say, look at Navalny, you know, he, this is Navalny, it's not me, it's not a normal person. He's, look, there's no one to help, no the West, nor inside, no help. Fourth, protests don't change anything. I mean, Putin's regime was for how many years now? 22? There have been periods with regimes, in 2000, with, with protests, with big protests, 2011, 2012. Did it change anything? No. Fifth, feeling isolated. The feeling that the West is not anymore supporting us. And that it will not come there to save us. Sixth reason, 42% of the population in Russia is dependent on the state in one way or another. Are they employed in the administration or in schools, etc., in the state sector? 42%. If they go and protest, they'll lose their job, they'll hardly have any chances. Actually, the private business, the big businesses are also very much dependent on the state. So. It's simply, uh, you know, how are you making your living? Se seven, mm, the, the most active protesters and leaders of the protests have already left the country. Of course, this drains out the energy of protest um, from the country. And the last reason, distrust in the opposition. Simply, the media was destroyed, independent media was destroyed, and now the opposition voices do not have a platform where to communicate with the people and how to get them organized. So this is like very objectively what I think was interesting to mention um, of what they found out in, in Russia. Um, and I think we, uh, when you say two million people go out, yes, but these are two million individuals that have to go through all these considerations. Do I go or do I not go? And yeah. I mean, I'm also interested, um, I completely understand that it's not for everyone to become an oppositional figure. Uh, and there are these, in the Russian tradition, of course you have uh, Alexei Navalny, but also Vladimir Karamurza, people who are going to Russia knowing that they will be in, uh, imprisoned. Um, where I think I couldn't do that, for example, but I have, of course, also a different relationship to any state and to nation as a, and to ideas or ideologies. And um, Marcy, in your book, Kavya and Ashes, you actually describe a very specific group of Polish avant-gardists that are in the 20s uh, believing in Marxism. And they somehow get crushed between sort of the First World War, the Second World War, and specifically of Stalinism, Stalin's terror, which which they got believing that they would maybe build up a better life uh, and it didn't happen, a better society. So I wonder what you would think was the specific about your Marxists there in Poland, why they sort of also believed that it was necessary to uh, not just follow the flow of what was possible, but actively also propose ideas, because that's, I think, which drives uh, also today's oppositionals that go out uh, of their way and in very dangerous situations. Well, the, the people I wrote about in my first book, Caviar and Ashes, this circle of Polish avant-garde poets from the generation born around 1900 who came of age during the First World War, it was a special group, you know, and they were, they were looking for something. They had, you know, an intense sense you know, of their own agency and responsibility. I mean, from the time they were teenagers, they were sitting at the literary cafes and scribbling poetry on napkins and actually believing the world moved on what they said to one another there. You know, and at some point there was a kind of, that was, it was too much to bear. They were longing for revolution. Revolution for them was like a great fire in which you throw yourself, burn yourself. You know, they wanted to change the world. It was, it was a kind of radical giving of themselves. Like these weren't, and the stakes were high, but they needed them to be high. Um, there was, you know, in, in German, you would use these words like Grenzerfahrung and Grenzsituation, that kind of, that, that being drawn to 
like that you need to give your life for something great. Um, I think that to mobilize ordinary people, that you are talking about how do you get to that magic moment where a critical mass you know, is willing to engage in something that in some way is profoundly irrational. And this was my, the last book I wrote was about the Maidan, was about the Ukrainian revolution of 2013 to 2014. And that was what so captivated me because it was the first time in my whole adult life that I'd been hanging out in Eastern Europe that I was watching a real revolution, like in, in real time. You know, and, and what I saw was that, you know, when those, those, young people went out onto the square, onto the Maidan in Kiev in November 2013, saying, you know, Ukraine is Europe, you know, and holding hands and singing and playing music and you know, wanting to be, wanting the association agreement with the EU to be joined, wanting to join Europe. Nobody was thinking, we're going to die here and we're willing to die here. And even, I was in Vienna at the time, and I was watching it streamed. You know, the Maidan had cameras on themselves. You could, you could watch them stream 24 hours a day. And by the second half of January, even from a distance, you could feel that something almost palpably had turned. There had been an existential transformation, and a critical mass of people were willing to die there, if need be. And you could feel that. You know, something happened. That society changed. A critical mass of people changed. And then you were waiting in terror for the climax of this. And when the violence came and when the massacre came and those snipers came in February 2014, you knew that those people were going to fight. That, they had, that, that decision had been made and it had been made by a critical mass of people and that in a way that those same people might not have ever expected themselves to be capable of, and that's kind of the magic of revolution. So historians look back at those moments. Hannah Arendt speaks about the lost treasure of revolution beyond victory or defeat. You know, and, and sociologists try to figure out under what, what is the cocktail? What is that magical cocktail that at a certain moment you have people willing to do something that in some ways, if you're thinking individually, is profoundly irrational? But of course, in, on the Maidan, we had also the promise of freedom. Uh, in Russia now, to protest publicly, you have the promise of prison. And um, Desi, the question on the cultural sphere, you know, for Marina Davidova, it was very mm -hmm. dangerous at the time when she sort of made her way <laughs> to mm -hmm. also Kirill Serebrennikov, maybe sits more comfortably already in Berlin and it's easier to criticize the world. But people like, for example, Marina Obzvanikova, when she went, I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember this mm -hmm. Russian journalist, from uh, Pervi Canal, she got up, yeah. she held up this uh, uh, transparent yeah. in, in the, during the news. Yeah. And at that moment, it went like a firebrand through the entire, uh, all my Russian friends, we were all sort of thinking like, what is this real, is this not real, what does it mean? It was incredibly um, important, but till today, this poor woman is yeah. being hounded by people who say, that she's an agent and that she, why did she stay so long in the system? It, that cannot be true that she then decided to become, and for me this is always so interesting because I thought it was totally credible that mm -hmm. she at that point, as a Ukrainian Russian person who had supported the regime for, not supported the regime, but supported making the media for the regime mm -hmm. and their false truth, um, that she said that's the point where I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But she's very controversial, and I might not be right also, by the way, because who knows. But she's in Paris now, and Rep Re uh, Reporters Without Borders is trying to help her with a new life. But Desi, what is the point? What yeah. does it, what, what yeah. makes it important to people to have this spine to stand up and say like, no? Yeah, actually, uh, it's good you mentioned Marina Davidova because I followed very closely, because she's a close friend of mine, her process of what happened these days after 24th of February last year, when immediately when the war was uh, announced, she wrote a kind of petition in her Facebook, she has a huge following there in Russia, saying this is a criminal war, it should be stopped, it's bratobistvena vena. Uh, it should, and it was an appeal to the government to put in himself and saying, please sign here. And the first thing I noticed, there were like immediately 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 likes, but people who write underneath, yes, I support this text, were like 50, then 80, then 100, and I'm like, uh-huh, people are afraid. 
then I asked her, but Marina, what is going on? Wouldn't people go out of the street? And she wrote me with dead big letters. This is not going to happen. And, okay. And she was like, but it's okay. But it's a person who has always been against this regime. So she's a free person. She feels free. She felt free to, um, to express this. And I think I noticed how I have the feeling that I see that now things are getting serious there and people like her have to leave. And she didn't have this feeling yet. There were a few days when she was like, but now, why, how? Then second or third day, there was a big Z on her door uh, written and she was like, uh, but what is this? That, no, we didn't know what the Z is. I, she sent me the photo and I was like, what is this? And she, even she didn't know at that time. She said, apparently they're marking people which are animals of the state, so to say. And this is the sign and I'm like, Marina, you should leave. Anyhow, she left and other people did their heroic uh, gestures, other not, others simply left, but they're people with history of not supporting this regime and, uh, you know, being against it have left. There are many, many Russians who have left and I think the interesting question is how we meet them on the other side of the border, how we meet them here in Europe, um, in other places. And I think there are Thing that bar things that bother me here. On one hand is that, you know, um, if you compare even historically what was happening in the Second World War and before the Second World War when Germans, not necessarily Jews, but were leaving and going to the U USA, no one was saying, no, you come from a fascist country, that's why you don't have the right to live here, to work here, to da da da. They were met with open arms. Well, that's that maybe an exaggeration. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not, uh, why exaggeration? There were special institutions being No, created. no, but I mean, a lot of people didn't get visas to enter America or England, and it was very hard for yes, people but, to you know, yeah. Intellectuals yeah. were invited yeah. to go, the whole no, no, institutions sure. were intellectuals. But what, where were you're right etc. is, I think that people are more judged now for leaving. You know, when, when people left uh, Nazi Germany, I mean, nobody thought that they were traitors to Germany. Well, now Russian young men that don't want to be conscripted and say that we, we want to go to another place, we don't want to support this war. And then the big question is from coming from others that say, like, you go home to Russia yeah. and, and, and start the revolution against the mm. regime. Yeah. That's what you mean, I think. Yeah? yeah, but the other thing that bothers me is how we are, many of these people, and we know several cases, are treated in the public life, so to say. We have several examples that we can mention of uh, Russians being basically canceled, you know, not being allowed, and canceled by whom? by Ukrainians. For me, this was a shock, actually, to find out. And this has happened because, as you said, I'm organizing public forums, festivals of ideas, so to say, or other formats. And it happened to me several times that after the beginning of the war, that Ukrainians would say, no, no, I cannot sit on a table with a Russian, or even I cannot participate in a festival where, even in another panel, not in mine, there is a Russian, and things like that. We know the case of Masha Gessen, who was asked by PEN, PEN, your organization, which is for freedom of speech, you know, because Ukrainians didn't want to sit with uh, Russians, she had to leave. She left then the board of the organization, etc. We know the, the case of the daughter of Navalny, who was not allowed to speak in uh, Washington, I think it was university. Again, for the same reason. I mean, why did she yeah. start in Stanford? Hmm? While she's studying well, she's in Stanford, in Stanford, yeah. Stanford, yeah, I mean, it's so uh, these are people that are in the same boat, so to say, with the Ukrainians. They suffer. Probably they're not. Yeah, they're not bombed. Of course, their relatives are not being killed, but they're displaced as well, uh, like the Ukrainians. And for me, this is like um, I, I don't understand how how this is possible. And what I don't understand and wh what I think is important to state is that I think it is a responsibilities of our organizations like festivals, forums, others in the West not to bend to such requests. Because on one hand, on one hand I can understand the Ukrainians that are traumatized, etc. I, to a certain extent I can understand this. But I think my responsibility as an organizer of public format is not to allow this shutting down of the other people uh, to happen. 
Um, no, for sure. I think this is a very important point that one also the understanding for Ukrainians being sensitive now to the Russian language and the Russian sort of uh, imperialist behavior uh, is, of course, it's really understandable. But especially in the case of an academic debate in a, in a, in a cultural institution, when it is about creating also the support for a Russian opposition, it, it is very sad when you, they can't appear. Masha Gessen, of course, is a classic example of someone who has personally suffered for years yeah, as a lesbian woman in Russia. I remember when I was living there and she was sort of having a very public debate going on on, on the treatment of um, queer people in Russia and that was at the beginning of the 2000s and it, and it has become for her of course increasingly difficult to live in Russia with her children and her partner and then she, in the end she left so to cancel her a second time now uh, is of course uh, it, it's very sad and it's also very counterproductive. But there are countless examples like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, Marcy, uh, in the in the question, for example, the that where you started a lot of the European history in the in Poland and also the Ukraine, in terms of how national myth has. Uh, shaped uh, the history of Europe and we have now this attempt by Russia to say you know you have to denazify the Ukraine which is one of these more preposterous attempts of, uh, of, of portraying this conflict but where do you see is there a shift also in the Polish Ukrainian relationship to each other and towards Russia as, a, as an oppressor that is going on during this war now, because it seems to me that the, there's a lot of demystification going on while Russia is trying to actually keep up this, this myth of, uh, of the Nazi state that has to be dismantled. Oh, there's so many things going on at once. Um, it's been a kind of extraordinary moment in Polish-Ukrainian relations. It's been an extraordinary moment, in some sense even more so, in Jewish-Ukrainian relations, um, which you, know, you could couch as, you know, there's a common enemy, you could, but the things that it seemed that Poles and Ukrainians would never, there would never be a moment of reconciliation. And they were, they were very gruesome histories of, of ethnic cleansing, you know, in particular by Ukrainian nationalists of Poles in 1943 during the Second World War. Um, you know, there was Ukrainian collaboration with Nazi Germany um, against Jews. You know, there were, there were pogroms, you know, there were like, there's really a lot of stuff. I mean, there was also ethnic cleansing, you know, of Ukrainians by Poles. And, um, but the extent to which so many different, I mean, what, you could look at the Jews and the Poles and the Ukrainians now through the prism of what the Czech philosopher Jan Patoshka called the solidarity of the shaken. You know, a sense of those are the people who share a dark history and understand deeply what this is about. Um, I, I feel like the, you know, the Americans have a much vaguer sense. The West Europeans also seem to have a very vague sense. The French seem to have an extremely vague sense. You know, the, the Swiss as well. But like the Poles, the Lithuanians, um, you know, certainly the Jews, they understand. You know, there's a sense of understanding what's going on. And it, it's a huge historical turning point. I mean, in some sense, that's the, you know, I've, like, I, I'm an American Jew, and I've done a lot of outreach since this full-scale invasion started to American Jewish audiences. I'm nor I normally don't come out, you know, publicly, you know, and talk about my Jewish genealogy, not that it's a secret, but um, that's just not usually my topic. But given the exigencies of the situation, I've done it a lot, you know, to mobilize support for Ukraine. Um, that, in some ways, has been the uplifting part. I mean, what Desi just spoke about has for me been the most difficult part. I mean, in so many ways, this war is a rare instance of a kind of moral clarity. I mean, it's, it's relatively rare, historically speaking, to have this kind of moral clarity. I mean, you have this neo-totalitarian power that just shows up and, and carries out a reign of terror, you know, slaughtering, torturing civilians with no provocation. I mean, they're right in front of the eyes of the whole world, you know. So there's, 
it's a rare instance of moral clarity. I mean, there was never a moment where like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe there was really a good reason. No, I mean, it's just like, it, it's just grotesque. Um, what I find myself struggling much more with is this question of how to relate to the Russians. Um, given a situation where, like, I look at Masha Gessen, who is, you know, not that I agree with every decision she's ever made, but she's someone I respect tremendously. And she's someone who is much, much braver than I am. You know, and I, I look at my Ukrainian friends who are going through hell, and I think I have no right to judge them or tell them they should sit anywhere with any Russians. I grew up in a Jewish community. I know how survivors and other Jews felt about ever having anything to do with the German again, um, which I as a child absorbed without really taking a position on. I don't feel I have any right to judge the Ukrainians, but I also feel I don't have any right as an American to judge Russian oppositionists who are so much braver than I am, many of whom have taken personal risk that I know I would not take. And I also feel as an American that, you know, I know what, I, I know how I felt and what I did in 2016 when Trump won the election. You know, I took my little kids to demonstrations from the very beginning. You know, I was, I debated fleeing the country. My family and I debated fleeing the country. We almost did. You know, I spoke out, but I also knew at all of those demonstrations where I had one little kid on one hand and one little kid on the other hand, I knew that the moment I felt something turning violent, I was gonna get my kids out of there. I never had any illusions that I was gonna be a hero. I never had any illusions that I was going to be willing to sit in prison and be separated from my children. You know, and January 6th could have gone the other way you know, we were a hair's breadth away from a fascist coup. You know, what the Trump administration was doing, wrenching kids away from their parents on the Mexican border and throwing them in cages, you know, which reminded me of many stories I heard about the Holocaust as a child. I was implicated in that, you know, as was everybody, you know, who was part of this country by the same logic. I felt implicated in that, you know, I knew what that meant. Um, you know, I tore my hair out about it all the time, but I didn't find a, a magical way that I myself could put a stop to it. And so I don't feel that I'm in, have in any position, you know, to look at the Russian oppositionist and say, I won't sit at the same table with you. I mean, last week I did a public talk in Prague with Jana Yemsova. Um, you know, and again, like I, I gave and in, in, uh, did a long interview with Anna Nemser, who was, you know, one of the women on the panel Masha Gessen had organized at the Penn Club that was, was then canceled, and I know Anna felt terrible about that. She felt like if I had any idea the Ukrainians didn't want me there, I would leave immediately. I don't want to take up their airspace. Um, but I, I would never refuse to talk to Anna. And when I talked to Anna, you know, she, she was in Tbilisi, I think. She was one of the many who left. You know, I mean, she was just in torment. You know, she was tearing her hair out. I mean, she felt intensely guilty for being Russian. She's like, how can we, what can we do? How can we reach people? I said, Anna, these are your people, you tell me. I mean, you're, you're the one who lived in Russia. She's like, I don't like, I, I don't know. I don't understand. I don't like, you know, we'll never forgive ourselves. We'll never forgive them. I don't know how we failed to reach the people. I don't, I, I feel very empathetic. To them. Yeah, but I think what um, is also clear now that uh, that in a totalitarian state like Russia is at the moment, it's what you also quoted, uh, Marcy Vasil Cherepanin, um, uh, Ukrainian art curator, said that Russian society has become an anti-society mm -hmm. because you're labeled as a foreign agent bef before you have actually finished the sentence mm -hmm. that criticizes the regime, um, which makes it really very hard and to expect people to resist is is, is difficult. So I think it's worth looking a little bit at the silent uh, majority mm -hmm. that goes through a totalitarian period in a, in a regime, or also not even totalitarian, but also you know, in the case of uh, uh, the post Second World War period when countries like Bulgaria were part of the Warsaw Pact states and were you know, or the GDR, the Ostdeutschland, where it was difficult for people to have a free uh, expression of opinion, and many still had relatively normal lives. And and so you had the experience uh, in your childhood. So how 
how was the debate uh, in your family or with your parents? Did you ask them afterwards why did you not stand up uh, against Zhivkov, who ruled from 54 to 89, 35 years, the same mm. man in power? Nothing happened for most of these years to develop yeah. also the society. Yeah. Or, yeah, so you, how was that? You, when you say, Marcy, I don't understand why people can be silent mm. and not protest, I think actually I understand somehow, and it's because I was born in Bulgaria. And um, well, but and I, I was born in a family which was, um, so to say, silently against the regime. Let's put it like this. My grandfather was actually sent to camp because every he was a textile pro pro producer, factory owner. Mm -hmm. Everything was confiscated and things like that. He was sent to to the camp, etc. My father had difficulties with finishing studying. He was kicking for political reason, being kicked out and not allowed to work, et cetera, et cetera. Different, different story, difficult story. Um, but uh, on my mother's side, uh, Orthodox priest, so you can imagine <laughs> nothing <laughs> close to the Communist Party. Um, but when I grew up, I was growing up, my teenage years came in the 80s, when actually the system was opening and perestroika was starting and then eventually the, the wall fell. And I think it's a very big difference between this, the youth of my parents and, and my youth. Because when my parents were, and I talked to them uh, a lot about that, when they were young, for them, this system looked like forever. Actually, for many people, actually, there is this anecdote which is true, that uh, Zelio Zelev, who was the first uh, democratic elected president of Bulgaria after 89, on the eve when Todor Zhivkov fell, he said, oh, probably my grandchildren one day will see the communist uh, collapse, the system collapsing. On the 10th of November, 89, he was saying, <laughs> can you imagine, uh, in that period, 50s, 60s, when people were being sent to camps, where people were not allowed to go to work in certain positions, for example, my father was a chemic, he was never allowed to teach because he would influence politically the students, things like that. When there is so much oppression, you feel you are, really hopeless. This system is so strong, it's forever, and there is a survival strategy, and many of these people with the biographies of my parents even didn't talk to their children about what their grandfather was doing about this camp story and things like that in order to protect them. Actually, if you read Leah Ippi's yes. book, it sounds very, very familiar, example. you know? Yeah. And I think it has been everywhere that, and I think now Russia, people are, feeling the way my parents were feeling. The, 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 the system there is so cruel at the moment, it is so oppressive that I see and understand why they're not there. It's the story of the previous generation that I have witnessed uh, in Bulgaria. I mean, Lea Ippi's book, which is called Free in Deutsch, of Deutsch Frei, uh, she describes her childhood and we had a Kreisky talk with her um, when her book came out in German. And it is really, like you say, Desi, this experience of the, the fear also of the parents to even tell their children what's going on because the children maybe go to school and tell their teachers who are their authorities that the parent has sort of bad-mouthed the regime and up everyone uh, sort of gets problems and if not prison, but then, you know, not being able to teach anymore or something like that. But actually, this happened in Russia, really, with this girl that made an anti-war picture. Maybe. But she still These things are happening yeah. today in Russia. They're still not reunited, the daughter and the yeah. father, yeah. when that happened. That's terrible. But um, um, the, the question that will be coming up is when the war is over, under what circumstances it is over, and what, how the Russian society will deal with, with all the individual stories of not having opposed or having yes opposed on, and how the world, how, how Europe, how America, how we all will deal with that. And for me, it's always so interesting, you know, the Germans now are being put up as the example for uh, having had a successful Vergangenheitsbewältigung to a certain extent. But that, of course, had to do with the fact that they were defeated. So um, uh, we can hope that Putin will be defeated and his regime will be changed to something more democratic, but of course we have no clue if that will even be the case. I'm just always thinking of the German situation and the silent majority when people talk about Russia now, because when a regime changes, 
the silent majority doesn't want to be associated anymore with the former dictator. So when the Nazis were defeated, all the Nazi symbols and Wehrmachts uniformen went into the next Kaminfeuer uh, because nobody wanted then suddenly to have anything to do with the Nazi party. And that is of course, that happens in every regime collapse that people are trying to make it to the other side, also to start a new civilian life. Yeah? So Marcy, um, you have sort of studied this, of course, uh, not only the German um, grappling with the past, but also the Polish. Mm -hmm. And that's a particular interesting case. If you think, for example, of the law um, in 2018 where Poland uh, sort of put it under, mm -hmm. under a, f a penalty to associate uh, the Holocaust or Auschwitz with anything Poland uh, has done because it was the Germans who were at fault. Can you elaborate on this a little bit? Yes, well there are, I mean the Polish case is, is complicated like all cases. I mean the first thing I would say is that, you know, in, in the German case, which I'm sure you, you lived through so you know it much better than I do, but there, it, it took generational change you know, a lot of what 1968 in Germany was about was a new generation saying to the parents, you know, what haven't you told us? You know, what did you do and what haven't you told us? You know, and that, that is what happened in Poland in 1968 vis-a-vis -vis Stalinism. The people who led the demonstrations, you know, against communist censorship or triggered initially by communist censorship in March 1968 were by and large the children of Stalinist. You know, and their question to their parents was, what have you been silent about? You know, you haven't told us this, and we are, you know, we are rising up in edible rebellion, you know, in some sense an atonement, you know, for your sins. I mean, one of the things I wrote about in my second book was, you know, people like Kostek Gebert who said, okay, I spent you know, if, if I spent, you know, my adult years trying to dismantle the system my parents built, it was because of the values that they taught me, you know. Um, you know, so it was, I mean, that was also, it was very complicated. There was a very dark history of, Poland would also like to believe that Stalinism was purely something that was, you know, it came from outside, you know, that came from the Soviet Union. It, that's to a large extent true, but it's not completely true. Um, it's never completely true. I mean, there's always, there are always things coming from the inside as well. And I mean, the Polish law, um, this is what in Poland you call politica historyczna, which is literally translated historical policy, you know, and, and the law that Tess is referring to actually makes it, you know, a crime punishable by up to three years of imprisonment, you know, for anyone who kind of, you know, imputes to the Polish nation, you know, um, collaboration, complicity, you know, meet machen in the crimes of Nazism or communism. Now then you ask, well, what, what is the Polish nation? Is it one member of the Polish nation? Is it all members of the Polish nation? I mean, it, it's an attempt to, you know, consolidate an identity, you know, of a country that has been, you know, often under threat by saying all of these bad things came from outside. Anything bad was like some kind of foreigners, enemies, people who came from the outside. You know, as long as we're kind of here, you know, with ourselves, we can find a safe space. And Dario Strola, my, my Polish historian colleague, wrote when the first versions of this law came out, probably 15, more than 15 years ago now, he wrote this kind of wonderful piece for Gazeta Viborcza, and he said, oh, now we know everything bad that happened must have been done by Martians. You know, like, <laughs> like, and, you know, so why is everybody so anxious about opening up the secret police archives? Because now we know there's nothing to find. Now we know it was all done by some kind of alien beings that, that showed up. And this desire to find a safe space in the world, you know, where everything evil has been kind of relegated to the other side of the border, it's very understandable. I'm enormously empathetic to it. You know, we would all like to find a safe space in the world. I'm a very nervous person. Um, but the tragedy of the human condition is that there is no such thing. There is no safe space. But of course, also Poland, in Poland, you know, you did have the German fascism coming in from the one yeah. side, and then the, the, the Russian Stalinism came from the other side. You know, it was, they, the Poles didn't have a, a lot of chance to develop their own own um, fascism and bring it to fruition because they were they were constantly being torn apart <laughs> from all other sides. So that's maybe why they have now this 
this sort of authoritarian um, attempts to rule over over judges uh, instead of letting democracy prosper. And let's hope that this will not stay forever. But can I come to your question, yes. like what to expect from Russia yeah. after the war? Absolutely. And you said what to do, what mm -hmm. shall we as West do mm -hmm. about Russian society after the war and to stimulate their Vergangenheitsbewältigung, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I think that it should not, it, w there's no role for anyone but from the Russian society itself to find the reason to transform itself or not. It might not happen, but no one from outside can influence there. Of course, there are two factors that I think would be important. One is, of course, how this war uh, ends, and I hope that Russia is defeated, and this will help, <laughs> definitely. The other factor is how Ukraine develops. If Ukraine becomes a democratic country, which is integrated in the West, in, in different, uh, in NATO, European Union, one way or another, um, this will be a bigger stimulus, I think, for the Russian society also to transform itself in that, that uh, direction. But for me, there will be a role also for these outside Russians that now left the country. Um, who else? <laughs> they have been against this regime. They have been for the democracy in Russia all these years. Uh, and this is one more reason why, if we want actually to have anything to say about what is happening after the war with the Russian society, we have to support these people and integrate them and be in contact with them and not cut well, them Well, I mean, <laughs> you are actively involved in this because you organize um, events and talks and conferences where, where people are sort of being supported also by being able to speak. Marcy, on the, on the level also of uh, universities, do you have the feeling that American universities, for example, do enough to bring Ukrainian and Russian academics maybe also together? Uh, let me actually answer that by, let me, let me answer Desi maybe more, more directly, because I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I mean, I think arguably the, the sort, I mean, something clearly has gone pathologically wrong in Russia. You know, the, the Ukrainian writer uh, Volodymyr Rafaenko used the phrase anthropological catastrophe of Russian society. There's been an anthropological catastrophe, mm -hmm. you know, and I, my sense is that it has to do with a crisis of subjectivity, just a, a sense of, going back to Havel's Green Grocer, a sense of powerlessness. A sense that, you know, this is, I, I don't believe it's a country of 140 million people who are just, you know, filled with passionate hatred, you know, for Ukrainians and just want nothing more than to go murder and torture them. But it is a country of people who are willing to go along, you know, who are, you know, who are basically willing to say, okay, I support the president, okay, well, I'm not interested in politics. This is a big phrase in Russia. I don't, like, I don't interest myself in politics. There's a crisis of subjectivity. There's a failure to accept one's own agency, one's responsibility, one's responsibility to think. I think the most, the most insightful anecdote I heard about the Russians leading up to this was from a sociologist friend of mine, actually here in, in Vienna, who, um, in the, who is from Soviet Kiev, she grew up in Soviet Kiev, she studied in Petersburg, then in Germany, and you know, has now been in Vienna, and she was doing sociological interviews in Russia um, in the years between 2014 and 2022. And a few years ago when she came back, you know, she said, well, one of the questions I was asking was, you know, what can, be, what can, what can we do to prevent something like Stalinism and Stalinist terror from happening again? You know, and Anna came back to Vienna and she said, Marcy, not only did people not have answers, they didn't understand the question. She said, to them, Stalinism, it was like Naturgewalt. You know, I mean, it was like some violent act of nature, like a tsunami. You know, it was like, you know, a, a storm. I mean, you can't stop the rain from coming. In best case scenario, you've got an umbrella in the closet. You know, but there, there's this crisis of, of seeing oneself as a responsible agent, which I think is at the heart of what's happened in Russia. And going back to how we treat the Russians, my fear, and I, I say this again, like with feeling like Ukrainians are going through things that I would lose my mind I mean, if somebody killed my child, I don't think I would ever forgive anyone, ever, in any circumstance. So I feel like they, I have no, I'm not criticizing them. 
But from the point of view of the rest of us, I think to say to the Russian opposition, it doesn't matter what you do, you are a priori condemned, we will never speak to you again. You know, because you were born in Russia, because you have this passport, because that puts people in a situation where it doesn't matter what they do. And that's what you never want. Structurally speaking, the structural incentives are all wrong. You never want people to, this, this, it doesn't matter what we do is at the root of the, the pathology in Russia. Like you want everyone to feel like it always matters what you do. You know, and I, I see now people like who I respect tremendously, people like Sergei Lebedev, who have spent you know, the past you know, decade and a half of his life banging his head against the wall saying, we must confront the Stalinist past. We must look at this in the eye. And he, he also feels like to speak is to take up airspace that should go to the Ukrainians. He should be silent. But if you're silent, silence is complicity. And so therefore, nothing, you're paralyzed. And that's, we don't want that, you know? Somehow all possible good energy that could in any way help to defeat tyranny needs to be mobilized. Desi, I, I see that you want to answer this. <laughs> um, no, just a comment actually, because you just said uh, some minutes ago about you protesting Trump and mm. with the kids, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But then you said yourself, if there was a violent force, yeah. I would have run away. Yeah. And at the same time, you're talking about the crisis of subjectivity yeah. of the yeah. Russians, but they're living under, yeah. under this yeah. terror. So I see a contradiction here, but yeah. maybe there are questions and we can... Yes, I would also want to say to sum up our, our debate so far, that I think the, the courage to act, the courage to act is maybe an individual choice, mm -hmm. but there is a collective responsibility of a society to A, also to try to prevent to go into a totalitarian system. And we have seen um, it happen in Russia. We, I was living there and it was, you could see that there was not enough time to build democratic structures. There was not enough time to, what you both described also, to, to, to build this distrust in institutions that would protect the people and that the Naturgewalt of the new authoritarian leader wouldn't just take in any case whatever they wanted. So I think we need to, to see that this is, uh, that is something that can happen, especially if democracy is weak, and which also Western societies have to look at very closely, as you have your Trump examples, but we have in Austria uh, uh, opinion polls that give 30% to a far-right party, where you think, like, what's wrong with you guys? I mean, we've been there already before. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, I would first of all say thank you to our online uh, viewers also uh, for listening to us. And I would invite you to ask us questions.